Thank you all for coming for this special service to honor the life of John Loy. And it's good to be able to have his wife uh, with us here and two of his daughters and son-in-law in person. And I'll wave at the one daughter back there on the phone with us. And for those who will be watching later on the video, um, may God give your family grace and comfort uh, during this time. These are unusual times. Uh, having small gatherings like this, but God's with us, and He makes a majority. So I trust that you'll find help and comfort today. We're going to go ahead and open up in prayer, and then we'll sing some songs together. Can you hear me okay, Bruce? Okay, great. All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You that because of Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection from the dead, that death doesn't have the victory over John because he knew you as his personal savior he is with you he's experiencing eternal life now I pray that today's service would be one to give you praise and glory for what you did for him years ago and I pray that you would give comfort to the family I pray that you would draw friends and family that don't know you towards you because you've been a good God to us and Lord, I pray that today would be a special day as we sing and as we hear from God's Word, that you would be honored and glorified and the family would be encouraged and comforted. In Jesus' name, amen. We did bring some programs with us today, and we're going to be singing to start with a hymn, Just As I Am. And you can look on your program, and there are the words uh, to the hymn. I don't know if I have ever led music to an accordion. Mrs. Miller here is a much better musician than I am. If I get off, you just go with her, okay? Uh, we'll follow the accordion, but we're going to sing these four verses of Just As I Am. And you know what? If you've ever been in a church service, you may have heard this song sung. It's kind of a common song at the invitation time, at the end of a service when we're being called to come just as we are to Jesus. And I want to encourage you to listen to these words. If God is calling... Will you come? Let's sing just as I will.
one comment. Cheryl needs to join the choir at church. And Brother Huffman, that's the first time that you and I have sung before a mic in a duet with an accordion. <laughs> <laughs> and it will, be, it will be the last time. I couldn't help as we were singing that song today to think of a person in door-to-door -door visitation out north of Greenville. I remember coming across and man said, I didn't hear the message that the preacher preached, but when I got to singing just as I am, I gave my heart to Christ. And I thought, how many a person has taken the invitation of just as I am? You know, that's how God accepts us. That's how God accepted Johnny, just as he was coming. And today, we want to just give you comfort today from Scripture. And it's interesting that the scripture God led me to, to share, uh, two of the three passages are connected to John's name, the Gospel of John, and also the first epistle of John are two of the passages. And I got to looking at Johnny's name and Johnny Paul, there must have been some Christian parents naming him, gave him two biblical names of two apostles. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. There must have been something connected there. I don't know. I met uh, John about uh, 10, 11 years ago, I guess it was. And he was in a time of need. And we'll talk about that in just a, a moment but it is good to meet now some of his children and we are glad that you're here when i think of john i have to think of a military man we see the flag here today we hear him talk and i remember in the first meeting that ever i had with him with jack samargo and i speaking to him he spoke of the military it wasn't an easy experience for him but he was a military man but also when I think of John, I think of him as a many children man, seven children. I grew up in a family where my mom had seven children. Only six of us lived, but four girls and three sons. And we're glad for those that could make it here today of the children. These are interesting times that we're in. We have funerals. Uh, where people can't even get to the funerals today. And so for you that are going to see this video today, I hope that your heart gets encouragement and you're drawn to Christ because of seeing the video today. Uh, we think of the children, and I can't help but think of Johnny and Chris and William, and then Mary, and then the two A's here of, of Amy and Alicia that are here today, as well as Crystal. Uh, I think uh, that's how you say her name. It's a different spelling for Crystal as I've seen it before. And, but I'm so glad that, that you will get to hear this. But I think of the many children and that his own life is gonna continue through the children, their mates, and the grandchildren. And I want you to think about that, that he is a mini child man, so he will carry on his generations through you. But then I think also of the fact that of his mind, at times his mind was not clear, we know that. I think the military and just talking with him that it marred him in ways that we probably will never understand. I didn't fully understand everything of the effect. He had some tough experiences in the military. I don't know if you talked with him much, but when people go through what he did as being a Green Beret, it's not an easy experience. It affects us. And we once again honor those that have served in the military and the stress and sacrifice that they have paid by serving in the military. But the last thing that I want to say that I remember about him of four things, not only that he was a military man, many children, 
but also his mind had been affected and marred in some ways. I know by talking with him how traumatic it had been for him. But then a major decision. He made a decision. Now we all make this decision one way or the other. But he made a decision that was the difference maker for him right now. And that is he made a decision 18 years ago on June 30th, 2002. It was made in Greenville, that decision. It was a major decision for his life. But we're not thinking Greenville, South Carolina. We're in Greenville, Tennessee. That decision was made at Eastside Baptist Church in Greenville, Tennessee, where a man by the name of Morris Gleiser was preaching a message. And as I talked to Morris yesterday, we've had Morris at our church before. Morris is related. Morris married Joy and, and also Cheryl's sister. And he's an evangelist and he was preaching and Cheryl and John were at that meeting that Sunday morning. But John didn't come out of the auditorium when everybody left. He stayed in the auditorium and Morris went back to speak to him and said, and then he realized John was crying. God had been speaking to John. That's June 30th, 2002. Eastside Baptist Church, Greenville, Tennessee. We're going to talk about that. And I want to say that Morris told me, he said, I was preaching out of Hosea. Now, you don't usually preach a Sunday morning message out of the book of Hosea, minor prophet and the story of Hosea. Do you know the story of Hosea? His name means salvations of the Lord. But it means also that the story he illustrated with his own personal life that God called him to live was the powerful message of how God loved Israel. This man was called to marry a woman named Gomer. Now that's quite a calling to marry a woman named Gomer, okay? I just have a sense of humor you have to get used to. But Gomer for a wife? <laughs> but you know what? He had three children by her. And those children were named to illustrate what God had done with Israel. How God had people that he had called to be his wife, so to speak, Israel. And how they had turned their back on him in idolatry. And how they were no longer getting mercy from God. That's Lo Ruamah. And then Lo Ami is the name of the third child. And not my people is what that means. And God is saying, Israel, you're no longer my wife right now. You've gone to other gods. You've turned to other husbands, so to speak. That's what Gomer did in her life. She left her husband and went to other men and was a prostitute and finally became a concubine or a second wife to a man, a slave. And then she came to herself and said, oh, no. I blew it. It was better with me with my first husband. I'm messed up. And you know what happened? Her husband heard that. And she was in the slave market to be sold again. And he went and paid his own money and a certain amount of barley and bought her out of a slave market and brought her back his adulterous wife to be his wife again. And Morris preached that message of how God loves people, even that sin against him. How he did it with Israel and how he does it. And that touched John's heart that day. And Morris described to me, he was all broken up emotionally over what God had spoken to his heart about that day. And Morris spoke to him about a decision. And we're gonna to go to a familiar verse. I'm sure all of you have heard of John 3.16, haven't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, a preacher preached this years ago, I'll never forget it, and I'm going to share it with you today. 
That's what Morris was preaching out of Hosea, was God's great love for people. And John 3.16 is the Bible in one verse, the message of the Bible in one verse. And it starts with the most important person, for God, the greatest person. You know, the world doesn't revolve around us human beings. It revolves around God. He's the creator of the universe. He's the God of heaven and earth. He's the sinless one. He's the one that human beings turned their back on and offended him. He's the greatest person. But then it says, for God so loved. Ah, the greatest kindness. The way God has loved the world that turned we as human beings to our own way, our own iniquities. We're gonna live life by ourselves apart from God. And yet God loves. That's the greatest kindness you can have in life. But not only that, God so loved the world. You know, that's the greatest extent of the greatest number. God loved everyone that's standing here today. Love Johnny, love me, the whole world, all human beings. God so loved the world. The greatest extent or the greatest number you can get, all human beings ever. God so loved the world that he gave. You know what? Gave is the greatest sacrifice or the greatest way to love. You know, Jesus said it this way. He said, no greater love than any man has than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And the way God gave, I'll never forget a man who had been divorced from his wife for a little bit and left his wife for another woman. And his daughter in our church down out of Central said, would you go see my daddy? He needs the Lord. I'll never forget a young preacher boy and I went to see him that Sunday afternoon and we went through the Romans road and showed him how he needed to be saved. And he had one question and after I answered that question biblically, he gave his heart to Jesus Christ as a 55 year old man. But you know, his wife that he had left didn't know Christ. The next Wednesday I went to see her the mother of this daughter that was in our church. And I remember speaking to her and saying, God loves you. And this woman was with bitterness in her heart because her husband had left her for another woman. Hmm. And I was saying, God committed his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You could just see the anger. And I said, do you realize how God loves us? God loves us in such a sacrificial way. You have five children. Could you take one of your children and go out here in your backyard and put them on a cross and crucify them if you knew that that would take care of the penalty of the sin of your neighborhood people? She says, oh no, oh no. I couldn't do that to one of my children. Now you know how much God loved you that he would take his only son and nail him to a cross to pay for your sins so you could have a relationship. God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, the great love of God. The greatest kindness, the greatest love is to sacrifice a person. And not only that, God loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. That's the greatest gift that he could give. And that woman got that idea. I couldn't give one of my children for the sins of my neighborhood. You understand that they're parents, don't you? You sure do. And that's what God did. And that's what God did for Johnny. That's what God did for me. That's what God did for everyone here today. Everyone that's listening to this video, you just remember. God gave his only son the greatest gift that could be given. But he gave his son that whosoever, do you realize that's the greatest invitation that it's ever been given? Any individual out of all human beings that wants to come and have what God offers through his son, that's the invitation of God. 
the greatest invitation, that whosoever believeth in him, believeth is the greatest dependence. Do you realize that little word in there? And by the way, do you remember who spoke this passage that I'm quoting? Do you know who spoke this passage, these words? This was Jesus speaking to Nicodemus and saying, Nicodemus, you must be born again or you're not going to see heaven. And he said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, me, be lifted up on a cross for you to look at me and be saved. He says, believeth in him. In there is a Greek preposition that literally should be translated into. Believe into someone. I depend upon this one that I become a part of them and their blessings. And that's what Jesus was saying that day. Believe into me. Whosoever believeth into me shall, shall never perish. The greatest rescue to be rescued from hell and the deserved penalty that all of us have. And that's what John was re, re, understanding that day, June 30th, 2002. He was beginning to realize God wanted to rescue him and save him from the penalty of sin and eternal hell. And the last thing of the greatest, not only the greatest rescue, but have everlasting life. That's the greatest possession someone could ever get from God. Notice it's forever, eternal, and notice it's life. That means to be not separated from God, but with Him in heaven forever. 2002, June 30th, this man received that possession and settled it in a decision where he said, to Morris Gleiser, I think I did that today. And they prayed together and just to settle it. And if you had talked to Johnny two months ago, he would tell you, yes, I am saved and I'm going to heaven if I die. Why? Because 2002, I made a decision. That's when I settled it. I received God's free gift of eternal life. Now, was Johnny a perfect man? I don't have to tell you that. If you lived with him, I know that. I know he's not perfect because I'm not perfect. You know, everybody says, well, he did this and he did that after he got saved. I've done some bad things after I've been saved. See, it's a free gift. I can't deserve it to get it, and I can't deserve it to keep it. I hope I change and grow and become better. And I think some of you, the children, understand that he communicated. Forget some of the things I said that were wrong. Forget some of the things that I did. I, don't, I have regrets. But you know, you may have regrets. By the way, this is one of the things that I want to share with you. I'm finding at these funerals, two weeks ago we were at Weldon Fraser's funeral with his family, 91 years old. But a lot of the family had regrets. I didn't get to see him. Those last months, weeks, I didn't get to say goodbye. Others, I didn't get to tell him I regretted the way I treated him and what I said to him. And, I should have obeyed him as a child, or I should have done this. I want to encourage you today, remember, you can't talk to him, and don't let anybody tell you that he can come back and talk to you, okay? I've got a neighbor two miles from us that lives next to a Christian family, and they said, this man lost his wife, and he said his wife has come back this week to visit him and sat in the kitchen, and I, I say, no, 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 that's not his wife, okay? We don't talk to the saints, and they don't come back and talk to us, but we talk to the God that has connection with the saints. And if you have some regrets, you wish you could have told him you loved him or say goodbye to him, tell God and say, God, 
if it would help dad, father-in-law, husband, whatever, brother-in-law, if it would help him to know that I wanted to say goodbye and I love him, would you tell him today, God has access. Now this may sound crazy, we're going to Mother's Day to Sunday, right? And then we're going to go to Father's Day. Sometimes on Mother's Day, I, I have to tell my mom <laughs> through God, I say, Mom, I want to tell you how much I appreciate that good cooking. <laughs> oh boy, did you give us boys, us five boys, some wonderful meals. And I should have thanked you more, Mom. I should have been, I should have been a better boy. You know, sometimes I'm talking to women that are about to die in our church, and I tell the woman, I, I said, would you tell my mom I've been a good boy? <laughs> you're getting ready to go up there and be with my mom, and you're going to meet her. Tell her I, I, I've been a good boy, all right? <laughs> I wish I'd have obeyed better, don't you guys? Sure. But maybe you're sorry the way you treated him. I run into people living with ongoing guilt, I just say, why don't you tell God? God, tell him I'm sorry. Clear it out. Don't live with it. Don't live with ongoing guilt. That's the way Satan wants you to live life, with an unresolved guilt or regret. Get it cleared out. You can get it cleared out by talking to God about it and let him communicate what needs to be communicated. Now that's not my message, all right? But I, I, I just, I find people are having frustration with that right now. I didn't get to say goodbye. I didn't get to tell them I was sorry. I didn't get to tell them I loved them. You understand how that feels, don't you? Well, the last passage that Morris Gleiser shared with Johnny I'm going to share with you, and it's one of my favorite passages. If you don't believe me, just ask Pastor Huffman. He's been with me enough times to see me with 1 John chapter 5, right? <laughs> Brother Huffman, I'm going to read it to you. Would you listen? This is what he shared with John that day in closing. He said, Whosoever believeth, that is, on the Son of God, hath the witness in himself within him, he that believeth not God hath made God a liar, because he believed not the record or the testimony that God gave of his son. So what does God want us to believe? He wants us to believe what he said about his son. What did he say about his son? Next verse. And this is the record or testimony that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. The next verse says, he that has the son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. And then the assurance verse that Morris really settled with John. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Could I illustrate it? today this way. I'm going to let this piece of paper represent eternal life. Now, eternal life, God forgives us when he gives us eternal life, and he gives us a permanent relationship with him. That's what eternal life is, knowing God and having a relationship with him through forgiveness of sin through Jesus. And this is going to represent eternal life. You can't see eternal life. It's a gift that's invisible. Let's say today this Bible represents Jesus Christ. This Bible represents Jesus Christ, his person, his perfection of his life, and his death for us, his work for us, okay? This is Jesus Christ. God says, and this is the record that God wants to give us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He says, he that has the Son has life. And he that does not have the Son does not have life. Now, Brother Huffman's done this with me before. Today, I'm going to represent myself. I'm going to be God the Father. And Brother Huffman is going to be a man that is like John was, and like all of us are, sinners. And he needs eternal life. 
and I'm God, and in my son Jesus, I have eternal life. It's a gift I want to give. And I offer it to Brother Huffman, and he takes it. But what does he do? He took Jesus as his, and in Jesus is eternal life. Do you realize eternal life is not in a religion? It's not in my good works or my bad works or anything. It's in a person. A lot of people think it's in a baptism, a ceremony. It's in a church. It's in doing something. It's in Jesus. That's what this verse said. And that's what John got that day. And this life is in his son. He that has the son. Now, once again, God's not going to take eternal life or Jesus away from anybody, okay? I took it back, but he doesn't do that. It's, he says, if you believe in Jesus, you can know that you have eternal life right now. Not after you die. You have eternal life right now. It's a present possession. In the Greek, that is a tense in the verb that speaks of possessing something now. Eternal life is mine right now. And that's the assurance that Johnny had. And you couldn't talk him out of it. Could you, Cheryl? You couldn't talk your husband out of the fact that he'd saved. Now, once again, he didn't do everything perfect. Sometimes he would get depressed, wouldn't he? Sometimes he would get angry. Sometimes he would get, you know, I could confess my sins too since I've been saved. You, so, you understand what I'm saying? But God doesn't take eternal life away because it's a free gift. We never earned it to get it. And we can't earn it to keep it. Now, I want to say this. This is illustrated in this story. What a savior. Not long ago, I heard the story of a university professor who was notorious for failing students in his advanced philosophy course. As the final exam was approaching, the professor announced that each student could bring one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with everything they could fit onto it to help them on the final exam. Of course, the students filled every inch of that one sheet of paper with all the information they possibly could because they wanted to pass the exam. On the day of the exam, the students filed into the classroom, each one of them with one piece of paper in their hand. One student, however, simply placed a blank sheet of paper on the floor in front of his desk. He then brought in a graduate student who was about to earn his doctorate in philosophy, and he had him stand on top of the paper. You get that? And all of a sudden, the other students saw it and started protesting. He can't do that. And the, the teacher didn't know what he was going to do with it, but you can imagine how much they protested. But he argued that the professor had said that they could use anything that fit on the sheet of paper. The student was the only one that passed the exam. Now, folks, that's the only thing that passes the exam with God. You need one person, and you need Jesus Christ to stand between you and God and be your mediator. And whenever the holy God of heaven stands looking at me a sinner, but I have Jesus standing in my place for me, I pass the exam of the Holy God. Do you get it? We need one thing, and we need Jesus. That's what we need. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to say for you that love this man, and you know the Lord already. You have received him. We're going to have this body go into the grave. And this is where it gets emotional for us, doesn't it? We think of this body going down into the earth and being separated from us, and we can't touch him, we can't embrace, we can't do that. But I want to say today, 
that's been settled for John as well. And for us that know the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren and sisters in the Lord, that you sorrow not even as those that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now there's coming a day when God's going to come and give a resurrection. And you know, at, the, at Lazarus' graveside, he had been dead four days. John's been dead quite a while, right? But it didn't matter how long. Four days and Jesus stood at Lazarus' graveside that day and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Augustine, the theologian, said if he had that day not shouted specifically Lazarus' name, everyone in that graveside would have come out of the grave. But Jesus designated one person. But do you realize one day God is going to say, saints of God, Jesus is going to shout, saints of God, come forth. And he's going to come and give resurrection body. And us that are alive and remain shall be caught up with the Lord in the air if we're still here on earth when Jesus returns for the rapture and the resurrection. And then Jesus had Paul say at the end of that statement, the shout of Jesus and the trump of God and the voice of the archangel and will shall ever be with the Lord. And he says, comfort one another with these words. If you know Jesus Christ today, you're going to have a resurrection reunion with John. He's never going to have any of those down times that he had because of his mind being stressed out. He's never, he's going to be perfect. You're going to be perfect. We're going to have perfect bodies. You'll get to hug him. You'll get to kiss him. You'll get to touch him. That's based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. I love the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it guarantees I'm going to hug my dad one day, my mom, my sister, loved ones that are in heaven. One day those that have received Christ and gone on that are in heaven and not in hell because they made a decision like Johnny. They're in heaven. I get to hug them. And coronavirus won't keep me from speaking to them, touching them, nothing like that. Isn't that a wonderful truth? You know, if you're Baptist, you can say amen right now, all right? You can. I mean, that's hallelujah. That's just shouting ground. Oh, it means so much to me when I think of being able to do that with my loved ones. How about you? So we're going to pray. And we're going to commit this body to the grave. But we're also going to commit it to the resurrection. Because it's guaranteed. Yeah, isn't it? But I want to say this to you today. Anybody maybe listening or anybody here? Have you ever made the decision Johnny made? He knew specifically, it's a time and place you get born again and you receive Christ in eternal life. He took Christ that day in East Tennessee at Eastside Baptist Church. He took him as his own personal savior. He has eternal life. He's with God forever. Do you have eternal life? If you don't, Today, could I encourage any of you that have not Christ, would you do what Johnny did that day? If you're listening to this video after this has been recorded and sent to you, why don't you receive Christ right today by faith? And for us that know him, why don't you receive the comfort of Christ into your bosom today? Resurrection of the body. Let's pray. Lord, I commit these people that are here to you and your son. 
Jesus deserves every one of these here to be his in heaven for eternity. He gave his life. He came out of the grave. He deserves him. And so today, if there's someone here that is undeserving of eternal life, that your son deserved for them, God, I pray today in their heart, in simple faith, they will just simply say, Jesus, be my savior today. I receive the gift of eternal life that you earned for me. And God, I thank you that Jesus died in my place. And I thank you for saving me today. We thank you that Johnny was thankful for that reality in his life. And Lord, I pray for the loved ones here and the friends that their hearts would be comforted over and over again of that reunion, that family reunion of your children that we are anticipating. And Lord Jesus, if it would even be today, we would be delighted if it would be today. But we want to thank you, Jesus, and we love you for dying for us, being buried, and rising again so that we could have that resurrection reunion. We will forever love you for it, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to say this, after the, this service, we're going to have the flag folding here and a song. But if you have never received Christ and you would like to talk with one of us, Pastor Huffman and I would be glad to talk to you. If you've never received Christ, that's the most important decision you'll ever make. If there's something you want to say to us about Johnny, we'd love to hear it because I'm learning more about him just this week. And I know in heaven I'm going to learn more about him as well. So, Brother Huffman, you want to lead us, and then they're going to come and do the flag. Okay, brother, so if you would do that. All right. Thank you, Pastor Miller, for the challenge. And for those who are watching on the video, I'm Pastor Stephen Huffman. I'm outreach pastor at Morningside Baptist Church, where Cheryl goes to church. And maybe you'll watch this in a week or months later, and you maybe have spiritual questions. Would you please give us a call at the mm. church? It's Morningside Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina. It's 864 297 7890. And I'm Pastor Stephen Huffman. And just give me a call and say, hey, I watched the video that you helped with with John Loy, and I have some spiritual questions. I'd like to talk to you or anybody here. Uh, if you want to reach out, we can talk today or later. So I want to share that information. Yeah. We're going to close with a song. It's a very famous song, and many of the verses were written by a man who was a wretch, and God gave him the greatest gift, and he accepted it. And he's got a great testimony, Amazing Grace. So it's on your program if you want to turn uh, to the portion with the words there, and we'll sing just three verses of Amazing Grace, uh, and then we'll have the flag folding. Okay, so Mrs. Miller.
Once again, we are glad where Johnny is, and if we can be a help to you, let us know. Our prayers are with you, his family, loved ones, and we thank um, McAfee for their service today as well. Thank you, men. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Take us to be with you. And Lord, I pray today that we would live the rest of our lives to follow your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name that you give comfort to these people. May they love you because of your mercy and comfort to them. Amen.